So I think uh, I'm just going to uh, start reading from the opening of the article because it opens with a kind of dramatic monologue, and uh, I've never actually read it in front of an audience, uh, and I think I'll give it a try. Sometimes I'll glimpse my reflection in a window and feel astonished by what I see. Jet black hair, slanted eyes, pancake flat surface of yellow and green toned skin. An expression that is nearly reptilian in its passivity, impassivity. I've contrived to think of this face as equal to beauty in any other, but what I feel in these moments is its strangeness to me. It's my face. I can't disclaim it. But what does it have to do with me? Millions of Americans must feel estranged from their own faces, but every self-estranged individual is self-estranged in his own way. I, for instance, am a child of Korean immigrants, but I do not speak my parents' native tongue. I have never called my elders by the proper honorific big brother or big sister. I have never dated a Korean woman. I don't have a Korean friend. Though I am an immigrant, I have never wanted to strive like one. You could say that I am, in the gently derisive parlance of Asian America, a banana or a Twinkie, yellow on the outside, white on the inside. But while I don't believe my roots define me, I do believe that there are certain racially inflected assumptions wired into our neural circuitry that we use to sort through the sea of faces we confront. And although I am in most respects devoid of Asian characteristics, I do have an Asian face. Here is what I sometimes suspect my face signifies to other Americans. An invisible person, barely distinguishable from a mass of faces that resemble it. A conspicuous person, standing apart from the crowd and yet devoid of any individuality. An icon of so much that the culture pretends to honor, but that it in fact patronizes and exploits. Not just people who are good at math and play the violin, but a mass of stifled, repressed, abused, conformist, quasi-robots who simply do not matter. I've always been in two minds about this sequence of dehumanizing stereotypes. On the one hand, it offends me greatly that anyone would think to apply them to me or to anyone else simply on the basis of facial characteristics. On the other hand, it also seems to me that there are a lot of Asian people to whom they apply. Let me summarize my feeling toward Asian values. Fuck filial piety. Fuck great grubbing. Fuck Ivy League mania. Fuck deference to authority. Fuck humility and hard work. Fuck harmonious relations. Fuck sacrificing for the future. Fuck earnest striving middle class servility. I understand the reason Asian parents have raised a generation of children this way. Doctor, lawyer, accountant, engineer, these are good jobs open to whoever works hard enough. What could be wrong with that pursuit? Asians graduate from college at a rate higher than any other ethnic group in America, including whites. They earn a higher median income, family income, than any other group in America, including whites. This is a stage in a triumphal narrative, and it is a narrative that is much shorter than many remember. Two-thirds of the roughly 14 million Asian Americans are foreign-born. There were fewer than 39,000 people of Korean descent living in America in 1970 when my elder brother was born. There are around one million today. Asian American success is typically taken to ratify the American dream and to prove that minorities can make it in this country without handouts. Still, an undercurrent of racial panic always accompanies the consideration of Asians, and all the more so as China becomes the destination for our American industrial base and the banker controlling our burgeoning debt. But if the armies of Chinese factory workers who make our fast fashion and iPads terrify us, and if the collective mass of high-cheating Asian American students arouse an anxiety about the laxity of American parenting, what of the Asian American who obeyed everything his parents told him? Does this person really scare anyone? Earlier this year, the publication of Amy Chua's Battle Hymn of the Tiger Mother incited a collective airing out of many varieties of race-based hysteria but absent from the millions of words written in response to the book was any serious consideration of whether Asian Americans were in fact taking over this country. 
If it is true that they are collectively dominating in elite high schools and universities, is it also true that Asian Americans are dominating in the real world? My strong suspicion that this was not so, and that the reasons would not be hard to find. If we are a collective juggernaut that inspires such awe and fear, why does it seem that so many Asians are so readily perceived to be, as I myself have often felt for most of my life, the products of a timid culture, easily pushed around by more assertive people, and thus basically invisible? <clears throat> a few months ago, I received an email from a young man named Jefferson Mao, who, after attending Stuyvesant High School, had recently graduated from the University of Chicago. He wanted my advice about being an Asian writer. This is how he described himself. I got good grades and I love literature and I want to be a writer and intellectual. And at the same time, I'm the first person in my family to go to college. My parents don't speak English very well and we don't own the apartment in Flushing that we live in. I mean, I'm proud of my parents and my uh, neighborhood and what I perceive to be my artistic potential, but sometimes I feel like I'm jumping the gun a generation or two early. One bright cold Sunday afternoon, I rode the 7 train to its last stop in Flushing, where the storefront signs are all written in Chinese, and the sidewalks are a slow-moving river of impassive faces. Mao was waiting for me at the entrance to the main street subway station, and together we walked to a nearby Vietnamese restaurant. Mao has a round face with eyes behind rectangular waterframe glasses. Since graduating, he has been living with his parents, who emigrated from China when Mao was eight years old. His mother is a manicurist. His father is a physical therapist's aide. Lately, Mao has been making the familiar hour and a half ride from Flushing to downtown Manhattan to tutor a white, innocent freshman who lives in Tribeca. And what he feels sometimes in the presence of that amiable young man is a pang of regret. Now he understands better what he ought to have done when he was a Stuyvesant freshman. Worked twice as hard, worked half as hard, and been 20 times more successful. Entrance to Stuyvesant, one of the most competitive public high schools in the country, is determined solely by performance on a test. The top 3.7% of all New York City students who take the specialized high school admissions test hoping to go to Stuyvesant are accepted. There are no set aside for the underprivileged or conversely for alumni or other privileged groups. There is no formula to encourage diversity or any nebulous concept of well-roundedness or character. Here we have something like pure meritocracy. This is what it looks like. Asian Americans who make up 12.6% of New York City make up 72% of Stuyvesant High School. This year, 569 Asian Americans scored high enough to earn a slot at Stuyvesant, along with 179 whites, 13 Hispanics, and 12 blacks. Such dramatic overrepresentation and what it may be read to imply about the intelligence of different groups of New Yorkers has a way of making people a little uneasy. But intrinsic intelligence, of course, is precisely what Asians don't believe. They believe, and they have proved, that the constant practice of test-taking will improve the scores of whoever commits to it. All throughout Shell Flushing, as well as in Bayside, one can find cram schools or storefront academies that drill students in test preparations after school, on weekends, and during summer breaks. Learning math is not about have learning math, an instructor of one called Ivy Prep was quoted in the New York Times as saying. It's about weightlifting. You are pumping the iron of math. Now puts it more specifically, you learn quite simply to nail any standardized test you take. And so there's an additional concern accompanying the rise of the tiger children, one focused more on the narrowness of the educational experience of a non-Asian child might receive in the company of fanatically pre-professional Asian students. Jenny Tsai, a student who was elected president of her class at the equally competitive New York Public High School, Hunter College High School, remembers frequently hearing that the school is becoming too Asian that they would be the downfall of our school. A couple of years ago, she revisited this issue in her senior thesis at Harvard, where she interviewed graduates of elite schools and found that the white students regarded the Asian students with a certain wariness. She quotes a music teacher at Stuyvesant describing the dominance of Asians. They were mediocre kids, but they got in because they were coached. In 2005, the Wall Street Journal reported on white flight from a high school in Cupertino, California that began soon after the children of Asian software engineers had made the place so brutally competitive that a B average could place you in the bottom third of the class. Colleges have a way of correcting for this imbalance. The, per, the Princeton sociologist Thomas Espenshade has calculated that an Asian applicant must, in practice, score 140 points higher on the SAT than a comparable white applicant to have the same chance of admission. 
This is obviously unfair to the many qualified Asian individuals who are punished for the success of others with similar faces. Upper middle class white kids, after all, have their own elite public school, private schools, and their own private tutors, far more expensive than the cram schools, to help them gain the educational system. You could frame it, as some aggrieved Asian Americans do, as a simple issue of equality and press for race blind uh, quantitative admission standards. In 2006, a decade after California passed a voter initiative outlawing any racial engineering at the public universities, Asians composed 46% of UC Berkeley's entering class. One could imagine a similar demographic reshuffling in the Ivy League, where Asian Americans currently make up about 17% of undergraduates. But the Ivies, as we all know, have their own private institutional interests at stake in their admissions choices, including some that are arguably defensible. Who can seriously claim that a Harvard University that was 72% Asian would deliver the same grooming for elite status its students had gone there to receive? Somewhere near the middle of his time in status, in a vague sense of discontent, started to emerge within Mao. He'd always felt himself a part of a mob of, as he put it, nameless, faceless Asian kids, who were like a part of the decor of the place. He had been content to keep his head down and work toward the goal shared by everyone at Stuyvesant, entry to Harvard. But around the beginning of his senior year, he began to wonder whether this march toward academic success was the only or the best path. You can't help but feel like there must be another way explains over a bowl of pho. It's like we're being pitted against each other while there are kids out there in the Midwest who could do way less work and be in a garage band or something and that they're decently intelligent and work decently hard in school. Mao began to study the racially inflected social hierarchies at Stuyvesant, where in a survey undertaken by the student newspaper this year, slightly more than half of the respondents reported that their friends came from within their own ethnic group. His attention focused on the mostly white and Manhattan dwelling group whose members seemed able to manage the crossing workload while still remaining socially active. The general gist of most high school movies is that the pre-cheerleader gets with the big dumb jock and the nerd is left to bide his time in loneliness, but at some point in the future, he says, the nerd is going to rule the world and the dumb jock is going to work in a car wash. But at Stye, it's completely different. If you looked at the pinnacle, the girls and the guys are not only good looking and socially affable, they also get the best grades and star in the school plays and win election to student government. It all converges like the top. It's like training for high society. It was jarring for us Chinese kids. You got the sense that you had to study hard, but it wasn't enough. Mao has become included to the fact that there was another hierarchy behind the official one that explained why others were getting what he never had a high school sweetheart figured prominently on this list, and that this mysterious hierarchy was going to determine what happened to him in life. You realize there are things you really don't understand about courtship or just acting in a certain way, things that somehow come naturally to people who go to school in the suburbs and have parents who are culturally assimilated. I pressed him for specifics, and he mentioned that he visited his white girlfriend's parents' house the past Christmas, where the family had sat around together cooking and playing Scrabble. This ordinary vision of suburban American domesticity lingered with Mao. Here at last was the setting in which all that implicit knowledge about social norms and propriety had been transmitted. There was no cramped school that taught these lessons. 